good. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. We're going to get started. I see that Ryan has got the recorder on, so we may as well rock and roll. <laughs> good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, our brainstorming to uh, explore our human connections. Uh, today, we are going to be exploring introversion. But before we get started, we have uh, the, the South Dakota Humanities Council has a very interesting program uh, for veterans. And seeing that it's Veterans Day, we have our illustrious Jennifer Whitman here with us today, who can, who's not only going to talk to us about introversion, but we're going to start off by talking about um, Veterans Day and a special program you have. Can you tell us about that, Jennifer? First, introduce yourself because some, sure. of, some of the people might be out of the loop. Okay. Well, thanks, Lawrence, uh, for having me here and for introducing me. I'm Jennifer Widman. I am the director of the South Dakota Center for the Book, which is housed at the South Dakota Humanities Council. And uh, most people don't have any idea what the director of the Center for the Book might be, but essentially sometimes we just say, well, I direct the Festival of Books, uh, the One Book South Dakota program, all our Young Readers initiatives, literary programs, and, you know, other duties as assigned as, as most jobs have. So um, I am involved in the Veterans Story Contest. Um, I'm not really necessarily the person who runs it, but we meld it into the Festival of Books as a way of highlighting those who participate. Um, so that's kind of the the area from which I'm speaking here today. So this veteran story contest that SDHC holds annually was just launched in 2016. Um, SDHC has a history of doing a variety of different kinds of uh, veterans programming. Um, we used to be involved in the literature and medicine program, uh, which did a lot of work at VA hospitals and other places. Um, we were involved in a national initiative um, through the National Endowment for the Humanities that was called Standing Together, um, which was trying to bring together veterans and non-veterans um, to understand the impact of war and of homecoming and just to get those two groups to talk because, um, you know, today we have basically an all-volunteer military force such a tiny percentage of the population actually serves. And so often there's not a real understanding among those of us who have not served uh, and those who have of what those experiences are like, what they really want us to know, that kind of thing. And so we thought here in South Dakota, we'd like to help some of our veterans share their stories. And it makes perfect sense. Uh, two of the three pillars of our mission at SDHC are covered by this veterans story contest. Um, one of them is that we want to promote civil conversation on all manner of issues. And the other is that we want to support people in telling the stories that define our state. And the stories of veterans and service members are some of those stories that we want to support. So we started this in 2016, the idea being that we would solicit uh, and collect unpublished material on any aspect of the military experience from veterans or current service members living in South Dakota in any form. Uh, we've had people submit work in fiction, uh, you know, short story kinds of things a lot of nonfiction, a lot of personal essays, sort of memoir memoir type writing. We've had poetry. In fact, uh, um, in 2020, our, our winner had completed a cycle of poems um, that dealt with her PTSD. Um, so we just, we want to throw this open and we do have some length limits and things like that. And we open this to, as I said, all veterans, all current service members living in South Dakota um, who have a story to tell. And then part of that process is then we have a small team of judges who goes through all of the submissions we receive. Um, Chuck Woodard, who's on this call today or this Zoom, has participated is, as a judge several times, I believe. Um, we try to have those be people who are, of course, familiar with 
literature and writing and that kind of skill. And also as often as possible, veterans who, you know, will have some sense of the kinds of stories that are being told and how important they are and, and what kinds of things are being expressed. Um, and those, that small group of judges then chooses three top finalists. And we send those three final essays or poems or whatever they might be on to a final judge. And that final judge is a veteran and an author who has been invited to participate in the South Dakota Festival of Books. And that person ranks those top three choices in order from first to third. Um, and then at the Festival of Books, that veteran author does two things at least, usually more, but they do a workshop, usually about two hours long, that is geared toward helping veterans, service members, and those around them tell their stories. And that workshop is free to all veterans and current service members. And then we also have them um, ha oversee the prize ceremony. And at that prize ceremony for the Veterans Story Contest, each of the top three winners is invited to read their winning submission. Uh, and often the, the veteran author judge will say a few words about why he or she chose um, the particular um, essays or poets, poems that they did, what they felt was um, being conveyed and how effectively and uh, just recognize the importance of, of telling those stories. So since 2016, there was one year that we didn't do it because we, we didn't quite have the staff. We were in the middle of some changes. Um, but the authors, the veteran authors who have judged this contest have included Ron Capps, who is the founder and director of the Veterans Writing Project out in Washington, D.C. Um, Robert Olin Butler, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning Vietnam veteran. Um, a number of other people. Um, this year, we had a wonderful young veteran named Colin Halloran. Uh, who judged the program. We've also had Jerry Bell, uh, she was a Navy veteran. And we also try to then encompass this for context with a variety of other kinds of programs at the festival that would be of interest to veterans. For instance, in 2017, a, a big highlight for us was hosting Tim O'Brien, who wrote The Things They Carried and is, you know, perhaps one maybe the nation's best known author writing about the Vietnam War, uh, one of the most read books of the things they carried and did a screening of the PBS documentary, documentary on the Vietnam War. So um, it's a way of highlighting veterans at the national level and also supporting the veterans and service members in our state in expressing what they've been through during combat, during whatever other kind of service they might have done and in the homecoming and reintegration process uh, so that we can support them in that way. And we're always looking for, you know, more participants. Um, we do advertise this through a variety of ways and try to get in touch with VA hospitals and veterans homes and VFWs, et cetera. But uh, the more we can let people know about it, the better, because uh, we feel that these are really stories that deserve to be heard. Well, I'm certainly uh, hoping that some of the folks here uh, in, on our uh, Zoom conference will be able to reach out to people they know, and maybe even some of them have uh, experiences that they would like to share, um, because uh, it sounds like a really a worthwhile program uh, and all, that all of us can benefit from just knowing about those stories, I think, are, are important. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. <laughs> and okay, so um, yeah, just just timing wise, I'll just mention that typically we put out a call for entries in the early summer. Um, and so that's when, you know, we'll be looking for that. Maybe we'll put a we can do a reminder on on brainstorming when that call for entries comes out okay. um, so that we can go through the process and have that ready for the festival in the fall. Good. Excellent. Perhaps, I look forward to that. Yes. Could I, could I add just one thing? Sure. I uh, appreciate all of Jennifer's explanations, which are thorough. I've been quite involved in various uh, humanities programs for veterans through the years as, uh, as a veteran and as an academic. And uh, 
one of the things I was involved with some years ago, I, I edited uh, collections of South Dakota stories. And uh, I edited one collection called On the Home Front, South Dakota Stories. Uh, and I suggested that and did it uh, because as I said in the introduction, uh, I'm very much interested in expanding the definition of veteran um, because it's so clear to me and it becomes clear all the time that there are more veterans of war than there are people who have worn uniforms mm -hmm. and there are more casualties of war than there are people who have served in the military. Yes. And uh, I think sometimes we need to know that better and uh, factor it into whatever we do in regard to observing service and uh, honoring veterans. Um, that really is an undervalued portion of our population, those who still carry the burdens of war having loved or tried to love those who serve. And it's generational, you know, because um, that never goes away, uh, not only for the veteran, but for the those who have been in a relationship with veterans. You just learn to live with it, you know, live beyond it. And so on Veterans Day, today, I'm especially interested in thinking about and honoring the families and friends of those who have served. They're also veterans. Thank you very much for that reminder, Chuck. That was um, certainly uh, something we all should be reminded of. Well, turning to our topic today of introversion, um, I, I will start off by saying I would describe myself also as an introvert who overcompensates by being an extrovert. Most people wouldn't think that I was, I was an introvert unless they, they knew my monastic practice and they actually saw how I lived. Most of the time I live by myself. You know, most of the time I'm alone. And those are the times when I, that I feel I can be me. You know, the other times I feel I, there is another person that I have to present to other people because they might be freaked out if they saw the real me. <laughs> but but uh, I, so I, I have some uh, empathy more than sympathy for people who are introverts. So it seems like a good topic to explore. And we have a bona fide <laughs> introvert that's going to in, engage in that discussion with us. And that's Jennifer that you just uh, heard speaking about the uh, veterans contest that they're having. Jennifer, can you tell us a little bit about your uh, self as an introvert? How do you how do you see that? Sure, I would be happy to. And, and uh, I think you, it'd be, it's interesting to look at those terms, introvert and extrovert, you know, they're binary, like so many things that we look at in this society. But of course, introversion, extroversion exist on a spectrum like most things do. Um, there's even a word ambivert for people who fall right about in the middle of the spectrum who have, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of both sides. Um, and I think we have stereotypes about both groups that are not necessarily true um, or partly true and, and maybe a little misleading. Um, I'm probably as a child was a pretty stereotypical introvert. I was relatively shy. I was relatively quiet. I Sure, I've spent lots of long days playing with groups of kids in the neighborhood, but I was also very happy to be by myself. I was very happy to have my nose in the pages of a book always. Um, and I, you know, was cautious in new situations. You know, my teachers at school were always saying, you know, she's doing really well, but she, I want her to speak up more or, you know, talk more with other kids or, you know, interact more. 
Um, and I think that's kind of the stereotype that we have about introverts. And it's a stereotype because in part it is true um, for sure. I think as I've grown older, I've either become less introverted or, and this is probably more likely, have just adjusted to a society that tends to favor extroverts. And so we all make adjustments um, for the situations that we're in. And, you know, if you need to speak in public or mingle in a group or whatever it might be, uh, typically introverts learn to do that. Um, but what I've discovered in as an adult about it more, because I think as a child, I thought, oh, I'm shy and I'm sensitive because those were things that adults said to me or about me. And um, it felt like there was something wrong with that. And so adult, I've kind of been looking back and, and reflecting on that. And, and one book I will definitely recommend for anybody who's interested is Quiet. It's the power of introverts in a world that won't stop talking. And it's by a woman named Susan Cain. And I read this several years ago. So I, I picked up a copy at the library the other day just to kind of revisit it. And, and uh, just skimmed through a little bit. But, but it's written by an introvert who took some time to, you know, explore some history, explore different kinds of scientific um, definitions or psychiatric definitions. And it really helped me see some things more clearly uh, about what introversion and extroversion really are. And I think part of that, Carl Jung, the psychiatrist, defined this a long time ago, and he's not the only one who has, but he says introverts tend to be drawn to the inner world of thought and feeling, whereas extroverts are drawn to the external life of people and activities. Um, introverts, and I think this is maybe the most important part, introverts recharge by being alone, whereas extroverts recharge or gain energy by socializing. And then introverts tend to focus on, on main, making meaning of events. They're often considered observers and uh, extroverts are more likely to plunge into the events and take part. And there are so many related uh, criteria that go along with these. For instance, extroverts are more likely to be comfortable taking more risks. Uh, uh, introverts are, are more likely to reflect more before they speak or write something. It's just uh, you know differences in personality. But I think we sometimes think introverts are all shy. Shyness is actually different from introversion. Shyness is sort of a fear of social judgment or that you won't do the right thing or say the right thing or people won't think highly of you. Um, so many introverts are shy, but not all introverts are shy. It's not the same. And, and the other thing is, I think sometimes we just think introverts are socially inept and that's not the case. Uh, it's just that they'll go out, they'll do those social things, but then they need some time to recharge and fill up with energy. They're just a little more reactive to all the stimuli in the environment around them. And they need a little more peace and quiet to get back to, you know, a full battery, so to speak. So understanding that helps me figure out what I need to function in the world and not to feel so bad about saying, you know, I'm going to leave this gathering early or I'm going to turn down the chance to go to this football game and I'm going to sit at home and read books on my porch um, because that's just, you know, something that I realize is valuable for me. So um, that's, that's helped me to understand myself and also to understand other people who maybe are more extroverted than I am. Interesting. Interesting. So let's say, um, that the uh, person is an introvert and they don't interact much with people. How do, you dis how do you discern that person from the person who actually does have interpersonal skill, lack of interpersonal skills, and they want to be involved, but they don't know how? So they sit on the sidelines. So as a person outside of those people's head, how do you determine or how can we start to determine which people you are which? The people who just like, they really want to be involved, but it's scary, you know, or they, they just feel like they're all funds. And the person who just said, you know, I really... 
I just prefer not to. I just, I'm not feeling it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to offer you any fail safe way to make sure that those interactions happen, but I would suggest, I mean, the most important thing is to extend the invitation, whether it's a, you know, social or whether it's professional, you know, so you don't have the person sitting alone in their cubicle and you don't know, well, do they want to be involved in this group project or, uh, and they just don't know how, or would they really rather not? Um, so I think first you have to extend the invitation, but you have to do it in a way that allows them to determine their level of involvement, I think. Yeah. So, for instance, if you suspect someone might be, you know, wanting to be involved, but but fearful to step up, you know, you invite them over, but maybe don't invite them to a party for 50 people that they don't know maybe invite them for coffee or dinner with three or four people, because as a rule, introverts tend to open up much more in small groups and really enjoy deeper conversations. Um, whereas a large reception where they're just going from group to group and making small talk is, you know, a horrifying idea for many of them. So start small is what I would say, you know, don't put them on the, the work team of 12 people where there are no clearly defined roles and the person who talks loudest gets the attention and ends up being, you know, running the direction of the whole project. Put them with a group of three and have them work on something where there's a lot more one-on-one -on -one interpersonal art interaction instead of trying to be heard in a, in a huge group. So I, Start small. That's that would be my best advice. Okay, we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll come back to that because you know I think that there's some under the hood stuff that we can we can explore in just you know the mechanics of how you get that done. But I want to open it up now to our our group, uh, and if you care to, either in the chat or uh, if you care to speak up, would you define yourself? as an introvert, extrovert, uh, ambivert, or omnivert. <laughs> You've coined a new word. <laughs> it's like, I'm all of them. <laughs> yeah, I think we all are. And one of the things I wanna say is we don't, we give people opportunities, but we cannot change people. They change themselves. And I think one of the first lessons that we learn is to accept people from where they are. Because not everybody has to do what they aren't usually doing unless they truly have the desire. And I think the word adaptation to any situation is very important, whether it be whether you are involved with somebody or not, but it's how you adapt to any situation. And that's what life is all about. And we need to accept others, regardless whether they're intro or extra or omni, or whatever the words are, um, for whom they are. And it's okay to become aware of strengths and weaknesses. And yes, a person can change. And, but that desire has to come in within them. And if you see they're such an introvert and it's damaging, that might be like what you said, Jennifer, the opportunities. I liked how you said that. But other than that, I'm just thinking it's nice to know and be able to identify that. Um, there are strengths in each one of them. And I think if you have a lack of adaptation to a certain situation is something that each of us has to work at a little bit more. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else have uh, comments about their own intro slash extro version. Uh, 
and how would you identify your, yourself and uh, any comments you want to make about that? You, you can put it in the chat too if you're an introvert and you just say, well, I, <laughs> I want to jump right out there. <laughs> Anybody? Well, while you're yeah, thinking about I've it. I've got a question. Oh, oh go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. Um, I guess I would consider myself pretty much an introvert. Um, but what I'm wondering about is the stimulation of being in a crowd where you have, you know, where there are a lot of people or there's, there's just lots of noise. I just about go crazy with that overstimulation is there a connection there do you think between you know how you know being alone is i'm very very comfortable with my own company i always have been and enjoy my own company um, but but i really do just start to get panicky and agitated when there is so much noise and there's so much stimulation i just i just don't like that and i just wonder if there's a connection yeah well, well uh, yeah. go ahead, go ahead, Jennifer. Well, I, I can tell you, you know, from just reviewing that that book, Quiet by Susan Cain, uh, she goes through some studies that have been done on starting with babies and going up to about the teenage years, uh, where they uh, they talk about highly reactive infants. That is those who respond more strongly to the stimuli in their external environment, whether that be a loud noise or a bright color or a sudden flash of light or movement. And as a rule, as they followed those children and, you know, followed up with them every couple of years with similar kinds of experiments and to see what their reaction was like and then to see what their uh, personality or social interaction style seemed to be like, they found that the infants who were most highly reactive, that is they responded most strongly to the stimuli in their environments, were more likely to either self-describe or be identified by others as introverts. Mm -hmm. So now there's all kinds of different things. There's never any one thing that's the cause, but there is a correlation between that, that stimulation and the introversion. Um, the idea being it gets a little more overwhelming more quickly for people who have a tendency toward introversion. Yeah. Well, I, I would say to add to that, um, you know, when you are thinking about, or let's say processing data, it may, if you're processing lots of data, it takes more time, you know, especially if you're unfamiliar with that, that subject. You know, when I, when I get into a subject that is completely unfamiliar with me, I can become pensive to the point that people think I'm angry, you know, because I've completely disengaged, you know, from, from that present thing. And they say, oh, what, what are you pouting about? Nothing, you just, you know, I'm just processing all the data and there's lots of data. And the other thing relative to what you're saying, Lynn, is I noticed that if I get into a situation where like, okay, I'm a public speaker, but I have to say that if I speak, in, when I speak in front of a crowd, I'm drained afterwards. You know, I I feel like I've been playing football for a couple of you know for a couple of hours because, and I just feel tired. And I can go and try to do something, but if it's anything serious, it's, I'm probably going to screw it up because I'm completely intellectually and physically drained because it takes so much attention to to the audience, to people. Uh, and if I'm in a large crowd, like a big party, these exhibits and things that I go to, same thing. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll process a lot of that information. So sometimes it could be that the introvert too is just processing lots of data that other people didn't even notice. <laughs> you know, that's, that, that can be a thing. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else uh, have a, a comment about uh, introversion, et cetera? Hey, so I can wait. So maybe I missed this. I, also, I need to say hi to Todd. Um, congratulations <laughs> on your book. I see you on the call. So that's pretty cool. I love it. Um, uh, yeah, so I had a question. I'm, I'm an, definitely an introvert who passes an, as an extrovert a lot to a lot of people. Um, do you have any suggestions for how to 
explain to people like without going into detail like i'm an introvert i need like without going into detail just being able to explain in maybe some easily understandable ways for why maybe you're not going to do something or why you are taking a pass on something or going to be late for something or something like that do you have any ideas there well, I, I had been thinking of getting a tattoo myself, but then I thought nobody would know what that is, <laughs> what it stands for. <laughs> well, I don't know anybody. Some of the other people, you know, uh, what, what would you what would you suggest to Jeremy? I think it it's a challenge um, with those that you're not particularly close to. I mean it's relatively easy for me to tell my family and close friends, you know, that, uh, you know, I need to recharge or something like that, but it's much harder to do with people that you don't know as well. And I, I'm not sure I have a perfect answer for that. I, I do think people are starting to understand um, introversion and extroversion a little better. Um, the introverts are kind of having a moment, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic when lots of cities were quarantined and things. There were all these jokes about, hey, this is the moment we've been waiting for. Um, and so I think that there's been more talk about it, you know, different online groups that are, you know, the pride in, in the power of introverts and things like that, so that people are at least familiar with the concept um, but I don't know how, you know, there are certain situations in which you, you just can't, like there are certain work, work situations where you've got to do what you got to do. Right. And, and you can't say, Hey, I'm feeling pretty overstimulated right now. I can't do that. Um, which is why I think so many introverts pass as extroverts in the world because we've learned to adapt because that's what the world's made for. So, so yeah, I don't know. It's easy to directly say it to close family but if anybody out there has good ideas for expressing it to people who maybe are not as close and not as ready to hear it, I'm all ears too. Yeah. I well, like, I think it, go ahead, Lee. I liked what Jeremy had said too, that the reasons why you do what you do, whether it's introvert or extrovert, it really plays into it because there are times that change and I'm just going to put a personal experience here. Um, I'm kind of like you, Lawrence, I look like an extrovert and I really need my time alone. And I used to be out in groups and after my husband died, um, the grief process, I have learned so much. I didn't know what grief was. And I found that I could not handle going to large groups even as much as 10 and 12 people. Now, why that would be, I don't know, Jeremy, <laughs> but, um, and I, and somebody said, well, you, you need to start, you need to start, you need to get out, you need to do it. Well, I couldn't for some reason. So if we know that some people have reasons, but I don't know what they would be, why would that be a reason? I was just uncomfortable. And the same way with people that you ask to speak or get in front of people. And of course, I think that's a little bit of practice, but you brought up some really good points. Thank you. I was surprised when I was in high school and first getting on the stage and uh, dealing with stage fright. And one of the, the, my instructors said, you know, uh, if you're not dealing with stage fright, you're not really in it. He said everybody who, who's in this business, you know, there is stage fright. And you, after you do it enough times, you learn to switch that off and get into that moment. He said, but you'd be surprised at how many people who you would never think have stage fright. They are terrified the moment before they get on the stage. And the moment before someone says action, they, their heart rate is going crazy. You know, he said, most people who are in this business are like that. And, and that helped me uh, as I got into radio and TV, you know, that helped me to understand like all those times when, you know, like uh, in addition to being an, an introvert, I'm also dyslexic. And so when you have to read a script, 
and you're terrified. It doesn't, you know, it, it's not really a, 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 a uh, one of those recipes for a successful radio career, you know. But after a while, you know, one people had patience with me and you learn little tricks, you know, to, you know, to get by. Because underneath, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, I think I can make a good argument for humans are social animals and we need each other and we need to interact with each other. And I really have a hard time figuring out how people can get along in this world without someone else. And when you have that someone else, you still have to inter interact with them. Maybe you get used to them and little by little you can say things to them but you're going to need new people. Those people may die. They may go away. They may have other relationships that, that uh, maybe not marginalize you, but you have less time with them. Things are always in flux. So I'm concerned about ways to make available that carpet or the door, the portal for people who are introverts. It's one thing to say we should include them. But I'd like to explore, and I'd like others who, who may have some ideas about how we might do that, particularly if you are an introvert. What, what are the things that can make that ramp lower for you, you know, to be included? Don't answer at once. You know. <laughs> I can try on here. I don't know how good my connection is. It's good. Okay. I like your so, hair. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so I was a brutal introvert until I was about 14. And then um, I was kind of, <laughs> this sounds odd, but forced into sports because of my size more than anything. And it changed kind of my lifestyle. And one thing I found, I mean, I think you're right, Jen, in that, you know, introverts, a lot of times extroverts are just introverts who have adapted to things that we need to do. But one thing that does help a lot is common purpose. So if you're working with a bunch of people on something for a common direction, if it was a teamwork thing for athletics, or if it's even, you know, when we meet and we're talking about things that I'm interested in. I can overcome it more easily. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's it's something that happens where you find, you know, you're willing to take down that wall a little because you're interested in what your own kind of reaction to it is. And so for me, I've spent my whole life just finding those places kind of, you know, so I was, and I made myself go there. So I got into journalism because I just figured there's nothing scarier than having to be in that situation all the time. But then I found that the people I was around most of the time were people who could deal with those situations as well. And so I kind of lived in that world. I felt very comfortable with other people who could handle it well. That's really all I got. Yeah. <laughs> would, you say, would you say that it, it has to do with, dare I say, validating competency? You know, in other words, making that person feel like, hey, you have something to offer here. Would you mind offering it? Yeah, and I think so when you value it, something else. No, I think that's true. And then and then because you and also your value is more external then too. So you're willing to, you know, kind of show I may not have all the answers, which is always the fear. Like, oh, I'm gonna be seen as incompetent or whatever. But if I'm willing to jump in because I you know, really want to get something back, um, it presents kind of <laughs> this competency sometimes, but also as, as not, you know, you're a lot, a lot less introverted because you want to, um, you know, you overcome yourself essentially. It's just put yourself in those situations as often as you can. And it becomes easier than when you're in situations where you may not be naturally inclined, um, you know, to engage. Uh, you know, I, I, like I said, it doesn't take away that feeling, but it does allow you to uh, engage a lot better and, you know, you know, connect with people. 
which you're right. I mean, that is, it's the lifeblood kind of, whether you're an introvert or not. The thing is, I don't charge off of social situations. So when you say that, I think I'm very much an introvert. And then everybody who knows me would burst out laughing. So I'm kind of like, you know, okay, I get it. I, you know, it isn't, but it isn't the social thing that makes it go. It's the things I can get back and, and kind of, you know, be with people sort of thing on a more personal level, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, I, if we take, you know, it's one thing if you have like a, let's say a job situation, but I think social situations too, you know, like I would say, I finally had to validate my incompetency, you know, and that, that is to say that, you know, like when I was growing up, I didn't have many, let's say, uh, arguments or, or let's say, discussions, long discussions with my parents, whatever the, you know, like, okay, give me the rules, let me know what's going on. And often I would say, and give me a reason because I don't really understand what's going on here and I'm okay. But one thing that I was really irritated is if I put on a brown sock and a black sock and my mother would just say, what the heck are you doing? You can't wear it like a brown sock. What, I got, I'm, I'm making a comp, you know, I'm making a compromise here. I'm wearing socks, you know? So, you know, like get off my case, you know? And, and I, I, or you can't wear polka dots and stripes. Why? You know, like a lot of things like that, interacting with people really irritates me. That's why one of the reasons, for example, people say, why do you always wear black? Because now I don't have to wake up in the morning and figure out what's going to color match and, and have that discussion. Because to me, that's like a waste of brain real estate, you know? So I think it's those kind of social things that as an introvert, you know, I, tr I found like little tricks that I do that uh, makes it so I don't have to have what I consider completely inane conversations with people because they mean nothing to me, but they clearly mean something to other people. And I'm willing to like, okay, have that space, do that thing, worry about that thing. Homie's not going there, you know, but I'll give you this much, where I'll do this as a compensation. <laughs> I, I want to jump in and, and comment kind of on something that relates to what Todd was talking about, about that common purpose or, or having, you know, sports or whatever it might be uh, bringing you out of introversion, at least for, for certain cases. One of the other things that, that I have read is that, introverts are willing to and able to act like extroverts for whatever period of time for a few different reasons. One of them being work that they find important. Another one being people that they love. And the third being projects or causes that they value highly. Um, so it's, it's got to be important enough, I think, for that introvert to say, I want to expend this energy on these people or this project or this work. And in that case, they will do it. Now they'll probably have to recharge again afterwards, but I think that's a start. So maybe that, that is an indication, Lawrence, of what you're saying when you're hoping that what can we do as a society not to, or as individuals, not to leave an introvert out. Um, it might take multiple invitations. Maybe you have, maybe one is for coffee, but maybe the other one is, do you want to go to this, uh, you know, community theater play with me? Or do you want to, you know, come with me to help out at this food drive or something along those lines where the pressure is not on the person to be a sparkling personality the whole time, but there's a purpose that they're working toward. Um, you know, it's, kind of something to do with their their hands and their body while they're while they're also interacting and you know baby steps toward the next thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think that said, we have to do we do have to keep in mind no means no. You know? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because some people like if I say no, I already told you I, I'm not interested. And that for them, they're hearing I'm not interested ever. And you're hearing I'm not interested in that thing I just invited you to. Yeah. You know, and there are different things we hear when people say no, but then there is the thing of no means no. So we can take it no means no forever. And I don't, never have to talk to you again. You know, I never have to invite you to anything because no means no. So how do you discern? 
you know? Yeah, I think that's, that's a matter of uh, just kind of watching closely what their answers are and be saying, okay, you know, if they've turned down two or three different kinds of invitations, maybe that's a signal, you know, maybe it wasn't the activity or the setting. Maybe it was just that they don't want to do that. And I, I feel really strongly about, about respecting that for reasons that, you know, I alluded to earlier, which is that so many introverts grow up thinking they have to change themselves in order to be successful rather than saying, I have these other skills I have this deep thinking and I have this respect for other people's opinions and I have these great observational faculties and, you know, all of those things I can get in the zone working alone for long stretches of time. Uh, Those are skills. They just don't happen to be the skills that we value right now the most in our society because we're very much a culture of personality. Um, What is, you know, who is captivating a crowd and, and that kind of thing. So I think, I think to a certain extent, you know, depending on where you fit on the spectrum, um, there may be a time when you have to say, okay, this person just doesn't, doesn't want to do whatever it is that I'm, I'm asking them to do. And I, I actually have a lot of respect for, for people who figure out and, and hold those boundaries for themselves. Um, You know, I say I identify as an introvert, but I, I don't think I'm nearly as introverted as my daughter is. And yet from an early age, she seemed to be much more able and willing to just say, no, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, I can't tell you how many gigantic sporting events we've gone to where she has sat with a book and (laughs) doesn't care that everyone around her thinks it's weird that she's not watching the game, the match, whatever it is. Um, So at some point, yeah, you're, you're right. It's it's hard. It's something that we really have to use as much of our, as many social cues as we can. And, and that's not always easy. That's right. Well, and I think of when you say that, uh, Jennifer, I think of the vegetable salesman, which has become an icon for me lately. Uh, because, the, you know, the, I think of the introvert as someone who has great vegetables, but nobody's buying vegetables. They want pizza. And they don't know how to they don't know how to present the vegetables so that they are as attractive as pizza, you know? So they, they end up like people saying, well, who wants that vegetable thing? And especially if they ever taste vegetables that somebody overcooked, then they think they don't like vegetables. So they don't know. They, in other words, they can't appreciate that introvert skills because they have not been showcased in a way that you can see the value. And there are lots of things in all of our lives that we walk right past and not see the value, but they're exactly the things that we need. And these and introverts are often the same way. And it's not so much to me them, it's just people can't in the in the form that they're presented, people can't see it. You know, they can't see how that 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 particular trait is is highly useful. You know? So I'm looking for like ways to hone our skills to be able to pick up on that. And I'm hoping that we can crowdsource some uh, potential solutions. I am here today. I just can't seem to get my camera to operate. Uh, This is Betty. I'm enjoying this. Enjoy maybe isn't the right word. I am being very much enlightened by this conversation. I don't know how I achieve my age without recognizing that I am an introvert. It's really become apparent to me during the pandemic. And um, it's, it's, it's stirring up a lot of things like how to say no to something as uh, Jeremy was saying that you don't really um, it isn't that you wouldn't like it you wouldn't have a good time but I can I can get exhausted in the middle of something that I really want to be at and there's a lot of fun people great conversations but man I just get to a point where I can't wait to get out of there and go home (laughs) <laughs> and uh, I'm going to have my guard up and my understanding of myself going for me, I think, now. And part of that is because of the 
time alone I've had in the last almost two years. And I, uh, it's really cool. So, oh, and I did post a book in the chat that I did read several years ago. And uh, it turns out that all of my siblings related to the thing of highly sensitive person as a, a recognizable uh, thing that we all deal with. We're not all sensitive to the same things, but we do have a lot of commonality. And uh, it, it's, it's been helpful. So carry on. Thanks for letting me put in here. I'm waiting to decide to order a new laptop that maybe has a working camera I can rely on. Yeah. <laughs> Or maybe you could just open it up and change that transistor. That's you know. <laughs> My transistor is busy right now. <laughs> She's off getting her makeup. <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you, Betty. That was that was uh, excellent. Excellent. Thank you for your contribution. Anybody else have any insight into uh, introversion? One of the, oh, go ahead, Dave. Sorry. One, one of the things that helped me was um, when I'm here and there are things going on and I have them on my calendar and I'm thinking, I don't want to go. Oh my gosh, I don't want to go. And I thought, kick yourself in the butt and do it because every time you do that, something wonderful happens. You meet somebody. You get another connection. You, it was, it's just, you get in lighting. I learned something. And so that's how it helped me um, move from one place to another, basically. And it, but again, it's got to start from within. But sometimes you just have to boot yourself in the rear. I'm not on camera because I've got cancer all over my body, on my top oh. of my head, on my neck, on my legs, and I've oh. had lots of surgery, and I'm one terrible mess, but I'm a person yet, but thank you so much for this. It's been great today. Thank you for joining us, Lee, and uh, I hope you feel better. Anyone else? I was just going to add one more thing, and it's not really something I think that is very solvable, but, you know, when you talk about being in groups of people and the small talk that's going on around you and so forth, and then being a reflective person, um, I really like to sit and listen and just observe and kind of absorb what's going on, and it's it's you know, it's hard to get to that place because if I'm not contributing because I'm not really comfortable with that level of conversation, but I like to listen to what other people say, then that's kind of a barrier. Um, you know, how do you, uh, I don't think there's a, a very good solution for that where you just want to kind of be a um, fly on the wall and just be there um, where it isn't so noisy. But <laughs> Um, and, and enjoy that, but not always feel as though I have to be contributing. Do you understand what I'm saying? I, I understand exactly. And, and I think it brings up a dilemma, you know, for, for, uh, for many people, like, okay, that person uh, just wants to listen, but how do we make them feel invited you know okay you can take like like the situation we have uh just in this zoom talk and often you say you, you know i'll put out a question or invite people to speak and i know that there are people who will who we can say are are i uh introverts because i know some of them and I, okay but the thing is it's like uh some of the people I don't know if they're introverts. So if they're introverts and they're just saying, hey, you know, I'm just, I just want to listen. I'm okay with that. What I'm not okay with is my thinking that they have nothing to say or contribute and not creating a pathway for them to do that because I value what input they are. I'm also a white space phobic, you know? So like, if there's like, dead silence i have to like 
uh, keep pinching myself and says, okay, give people a chance, give them a chance, give them a chance. But the, but the, the silence is deafening to me, you know, especially when you, when you have a limited time that you're having the conversation. Like if I'm sitting in a car driving someplace and I ask somebody a question, they can take 15 minutes to answer. I don't care, you know, because we're driving down the road and, you know, I'm paying attention to the road and watching for deer and not a problem, you know, let me know if you have anything to say, you know, but if I'm in a conversation or if I'm in a conference and we, and somebody asks a question, you know, I will often wait. And if nobody said anything like I'm, you know, 30 seconds, I'm right in there, you know, because I do have the questions and I will ask them. And I also think it's often like in many cases, like in some conferences I'm at, I think it's, it's, it's almost a courtesy to the speaker to say, to, you know, to ask a question, to get them to draw out something that they had to say, but they need an invitation to extend the knowledge that they could, that they can bring to that conference. So I think that's the same way in my interpersonal relationships. I have a value for what other people have to say, but if they don't say anything, you know, I have a hard time figuring out, well, how do I draw them out? You know, and I'm not saying that is to say I don't want to. I'm just saying I haven't figured that one out yet. But sometimes I can, but often I can't. I, I might jump in with a couple of things about because several of the last few things that have been mentioned, I make me think of, of teaching. And I know there are a number of, of teachers and former teachers on, on the Zoom today. Uh, interestingly, all of those things come to play it from both sides of the desk, so to speak, in teaching. Uh, I, I spent most of my career before joining the Humanities Council teaching. And there's always that issue in a classroom. Um, in the humanities, literature for sure, we value class discussion and participation. And yet I know that not all students are comfortable participating in the same way. So it, it's a necessity to give a lot of different kinds of ways of contributing. Full class discussion, small group discussion, brief responses that are written maybe and submitted so that everybody hopefully at some time gets a chance to respond in the way that's best for them. Um, so I know a lot of us have, have spent a lot of time thinking about that as, as you have as well. And then the flip side of that as a teacher, uh, cause I know one of the things Ryan's interested in and, and is talked about, put a question in the chat is how do you overcome your introversion in situations where you have to be extroverted? And it's interesting how many teachers are introverts as well, because it essentially it involves spending the entire day standing up in front of groups and talking and public speaking is, you know, one of the, the humanity's great fears. And I think some of that is, is simply practice. Um, I think you get more and more comfortable with it the more that you do it. So all those years of teaching make me much more comfortable being interviewed or giving a presentation or something along those lines. That doesn't mean that the first part of it isn't difficult because you know when you're first learning and first getting into it, but it's kind of like what Lee said, you have to try something and have an experience that shows you you can do it and then build on that and keep going. Um, and, and then afterwards, you have to rest. <laughs> I do have to rest. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're coming up on our, our, uh, the end of our time here together today. I want to thank all of you for joining us. I hope that you have... Uh, found something of value in this conversation, I would like to continue my own uh, journey into looking into how we don't leave the introvert behind. And with all the respect of like saying, okay, well, that person is that way. I fear dropping into the uh, mindset of like, well, once they say they don't want to, uh, you know, 
because that leave them alone because that's my natural go-to thing. If you tell me once you make it somehow clear to me that you're not interested in the thing or me, I'm good. There's seven and a half billion people in the world. I'm going on. You know, I'm going to the I'm going to the next one. You know, and I don't have any problem. But at some point, I feel like well. Dix, maybe you're, you know, maybe that's a little bit harsh, maybe because that person, they want to be involved, but they don't know how. And finding that balance is, is something that, that I'm struggling with. And uh, if you're feeling that, I hope you will continue in that struggle as well. We'll see you next week. Um, and we're going to be talking about threats and how we define and what we, how we know that something is a threat or not a threat uh, and how we deal with the threats. So we'll see you next week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, <laughs> bye.